so with that said, I think we can go ahead and get started. We've got a full uh, a full agenda here today. So today I want to start by saying, uh, first of all, I apologize. Hopefully sound will be okay. I am uh, down at III at the joint conference today. And so I'm coming to you from an open space here. So there will be background noise and apparently 80s music is the uh, soundtrack for the day here. And so hopefully that's okay. Second of all, uh, Bill Rose, our teammate Bill from the NIU Illinois CTE project, Bill is out for a family wedding. So Bill is not with us today, but Heather's here. Heather, you wanna say good morning? Good morning, everyone. Glad to see everyone here. Looking forward to this, uh, to our, our day today, a couple, next hour together, I guess. So good morning. And and thank you to those of you who've already started with introductions in the chat. So please go ahead and drop your name in and who you are. We're so thrilled again to have so many people from around the state uh, with us this morning. There's so much we can learn together and we're excited to share some big announcements today. So this is our agenda. We do have some quick announcements. We have an IWAS update. You're going to be interested in hearing as well as being interested in hearing about the next couple months meetings uh, for the Career Pathways user group. And then we'll shift over to work-based learning and specifically the internship uh, section of the of the work-based learning continuum today with the 60-hour supervised career development experience. So um, again, thanks for being here. Want to remind everybody that the meetings are not really what we want the user group to be about. Uh, as we saw previously, we are now up, we had over a thousand students earn the endorsement in school districts throughout the state. There is literally amazing work happening all over the state. Do not be shy, please, about emailing the group with cool things you're doing. And later on in this slide deck, we do have the email address for the Google group that you would use to send either, hey, here's something we did, this worked really well. Here's a question we have, here's something we're struggling. Um, let's take full advantage of the user group. Uh, just like we see across the state of Illinois with the principals uh, in the IPA user group, uh, the listserv, uh, with IASBO and the chief school business officials and all the business office folks in that list serve and uh, the multiple tech list serves that serve our ed tech folks. So we want to provide that same space here. The other thing to keep in mind is while the numbers of students who are earning endorsements does keep going up, as ISBE came out and told us 11 months ago, this is not about the number of endorsements. This is not a race to have more endorsements than your neighboring school districts. This is about making sure that the endorsement that happens in your school or district is of really high quality for the student earning it. And that also from the process of doing endorsements for those students that we expand out things like work-based learning, career-focused counseling for all students that we shift all learning to authentic learning uh, throughout the school day and that all kids are learning and practicing getting feedback on the essential skills. So with that said, uh, we do have the CT calendar linked in here. All of this is free with the exception of the conference that is very low cost. Um, the next session coming up right after Thanksgiving is the in this assessing the essential skills series that was launched a few weeks ago. We've already had two sessions, uh, and this is by career pathway. So this next session will be focused on the arts and communications career pathway. Um, I know Bill and Betsy have really rolled up their sleeves, and they've got some different things planned for this one um, because of the different needs of each pathway. So that's really exciting, really cool. Um, second of all. The link is here for the ISBE website, which is the official website of the ISBE Career Connections Conference. The call for proposals is out. You, If you are here, you have something to present on June 18th in Tinley Park. I guarantee it. And or you work with people who have something to present. Additionally, we are days, possibly hours away from registration opening. There is an early bird rate. Uh, Rodrigo, can I put you on the spot? Um, do you want to share what pricing information looks like for the conference? Yeah, absolutely. i be happy to. So we're going to go ahead and run with a $50 per person early bird registration, which will go through the end of February. Um, and after that, we'll uh, be shifting to $65 a person. But um, 
from the moment it opens through June 18th, we're actually also going to be offering a group rate. So for uh, individuals from the same organization uh, with a minimum of five uh, people, they will also be able to go ahead um, and take advantage of uh, a lower price, which is set at $40 um, a person. That is for five people from the same organization to come through together. Um, and obviously for that, there's no limit beyond the five. Um, and so as Jason said, uh, here in the next couple of days, uh, you'll be able to go ahead and see that maybe as early as tonight. Um, we're really excited and we're hoping that you all come through and join us on that day. Yeah, so obviously at $50, people who've, who've gone to conferences know what a bargain that is. And, and, um, and that's because we really just need to cover a few minor costs that can't be covered under Perkins funds. And we want it to be as accessible to as many people as possible. So uh, watch for registration to be out. We'll certainly email this group as soon as that's out. Um, now we're excited to have some updates on the ongoing work that's happening in IWAS. Um, so Heather, you wanna take it away? Sure. Uh, as you can see from this slide, uh, for our user group meeting in January, um, we are going to open the IWAS uh, platform and I'm going to walk you through how to input all of your information and what that's going to look like. And um, just kind of the timeline of things, just as a brief overview right now, um, like I said, it's going to open in January and access to that will only be given right now to those who currently have applications in. So all of the current users of the PWR platform will have access to IWAS. Uh, we, I still am building the um, guidance document that goes along with it and the FAQs and creating a video for everyone, much like we have on the website now for the PWR platform. And we're just ironing out a few things as it relates to access and who's who's going to get that access and how we're going to handle that. Um, but you can expect the superintendents to receive the information from those districts that have sent in their application already and have the PWR platform. And then we'll open it up to the rest of the state, so to speak, <laughs> um, those who haven't turned in that application. Um, in July of 24, uh, because as you know, from 24-25 school year, that's when the decision has to be made as to whether or not you're going to offer pathway endorsements. Um, anyone who sends in an application between um, January when this opens and when it opens to everybody will get direct ac access to the IWAS platform. So um, PWR platform users now will just need to transfer their information um, and all new applications after that January 19th date will um, just get direct access to IWAS. And Jason, I know you have seen the prototype, so to speak, <laughs> and went through it. So I obviously think it's fantastic, but I may be a smidge biased. But <laughs> yeah, I mean, as someone who, who it was lucky enough to get to work in IWAS from its inception for different parts of my job. I mean, this, even seeing that it's part of IWAS, this is like, wow, this is really, it's really great. It's really up to date. Um, so things like you select what career pathway, and then you're presented just with the technical competencies for that pathway. Some really cool stuff. And then you're just like for a team-based challenge, you're just checking the box, which one or two technical competencies is this team-based challenge addressing? So it it should both really help people conceptually as be as well as be uh, pretty quick and easy to enter your information in. A um, couple of things, Joe, we'll answer that here in just one second. Um, so yes, the that is correct, Joe. And, and we've got a little more information coming uh, about that here in just a moment. The other thing I do want to mention is, because I know it will come up for our EFE directors, our CCPE coordinators, our area career center folks, um, we're going to continue to have to work through challenges on access. We know right now the workaround is um, if, if you can work with each of your districts to get individual access through that district, that would be the the default workaround is superintendent can give access to any user uh, that they want to, um, but that that's uh, the, the thing that we'll come back to. Kate, that's a great question. Hold on to that for just a moment too, and we'll make sure we address that here in a second. So if you are submitting applications that you want to go through now, so for example, uh, for your class of 2024 to earn their endorsements, this year's 12th graders, those do need to be submitted by December 15th through the current PWR system. So you can see the timing here is, is that will happen. And then 
Um, and then we will shift moving forward to IWAS. Um, as, Heather, do you want to talk here about the timelines of approval status and uh, sure. that kind of thing, which has come up? Sure. So um, within the past week or so, I we are numbers of districts that have just done the initial application. I'm not talking about plan submittal, but just uh, initial application to gain access to PWR. I think I've, I've handled 45 of those. So that is a, a little bit it's not that time consuming. Okay, maybe it's a little time consuming to make sure that everyone has access. So um, the response to getting access to the platform is happening within a couple days, um, um, hopefully now, because I'm, I'm caught up with that. As far as reviewing, same thing's happening. I'm getting them, and that's fantastic, over and over. Okay, here's my approval. Here's my approval. Um, so I have blocked out the next two weeks to be looking at all of these. So that, that's my goal. I can't promise that all of them will be reviewed in that time frame. Um, but that is that is my goal to get those done because I know that we will have more as we get um, closer to December 15th. So I promise you I'm, I'm doing my due diligence to get these reviewed as, as quickly um, as, as I can. So, and just, just calling out again, you know, when there's a lot of times that those of us on the school district side say, is be this, is be that. And two things I want to mention here. One is um, Heather is, is be on this. Heather is the one doing the approvals. I think people in here know that. And so it is an enormous amount of work. And that's also in addition to not only reviewing those, but trying to help people be successful with those and other parts of her job. And so I'm not saying that to be defensive on Heather's behalf, but saying that because everybody on this call is looks like and um, so help with that understanding. The second thing is, um, I think increasingly, I will give the shout out that we're seeing from ISBE that all the all the ISBE folks who have worked in school districts, you know, kind of recognizing that and trying to put that that knowledge into practice on behalf of school districts. So um, thanks. So we we did a survey um, uh, recently of the Career Pathway User Group to help identify some upcoming topics. And so we, we're trying to, you know, we collect data in all kinds of ways, right? Including street data, the conversations we have with you, the emails we get from you, the things we hear when we're lucky enough to be out in schools or, or doing a workshop in the field. Um, and so there was a wide range of topics that people offered, uh, said they wanted to learn more about. And so we asked, what would be your top pick? Um, and really the top three were these. The top one is what we're gonna do today, which is the internship, the 60 hour supervised career development experience. That was uh, over a quarter of people said that. 18.4% of people said the application process through IWAS. So good news, exciting news, January 19th, uh, fire up the popcorn or bring the donuts or whatever you want to have at 9 a.m. on a Friday and make sure you're there. Uh, let your friends and neighbors and other districts know they won't want to miss that. And then um, an application and capstone curriculum. So I think, and Heather does not even know this yet, because this was a yesterday afternoon thing and a, a back and forth, but um, Rodrigo and I were able to be in a school district yesterday afternoon, and um, I think it looks like part, at least part of the February meeting, we definitely want to spend on how we select which courses, what different districts of different sizes might consider in selecting which courses should go into a course sequence, including some of the nuances of, of which dual credit courses, uh, if they're dual credit uh, versus AP. Uh, or IB should be should be selected and, and what some of the considerations are with that. So um, probably coming up in February is, is the tentative plan right now. And so again, we're trying to hit the top ones that um, that we see in the data and then are having corroborated in the field. So with that, let's go into work-based learning. So most of you know the work-based learning continuum. Today, we're going into step four there, kind of right in the middle, the career development experience. We're also going to dabble in apprenticeship and pre-apprenticeship. Um, great question. All of the prior meeting videos are on our YouTube channel, and we will drop the link in for that. We have a special playlist just for the Career Pathways user group. So 
other great resources there too, though, like our Career Pathways Virtual Trailheads. So we're going to be on the right side of this continuum today, uh, whereas last time we talked about the career exploration experiences, which is off to the left. And so the, making this continuum active, and it's been really cool. I've talked with, I think, at least four districts in the last week and a half who are are really bringing this continuum out in conversations with teachers and with counselors. And so that is not something I had necessarily thought about, but I can see how that can really help um, shift to a kind of a greater intentionality with how we're using time and what decisions we're making about time and, and human resources. So cool thing I'll throw out there. So with that said, um, one thing, the basis, you can't do an internship unless you've got a partnership. We do have a whole half day workshop that does also qualify for an administrator academy credit about developing uh, community and business partnerships. And so these are some quick hits from that. Uh, that are all important. I'm not gonna not gonna read through all of these right now. But one thing that we literally just saw yesterday afternoon at Oak Park River Forest High School, uh, and this was literally launched 36 hours before I took the screenshot, is um, is the business teachers at OPRF um, launched a a page on on LinkedIn to start pulling together people who've already been volunteers, but other volunteers, a couple of crazy things. So first of all, in less than 48 hours, another, and they had not even posted it on social media yet. They'd sent some invites to some specific people. They hadn't sent an email to the whole staff yet, which is one of their plans. Um, and when I then clicked after I gained my membership and clicked on the other members, I don't even understand this. I don't live in Oak Park. I've never lived in Oak Park or River Forest. Um, I was a second or third degree connection with I think 16 of the 19 members. And so it just goes to show, and none of these people were educators. And my family's pretty much all educators. So like, this is kind of a cool idea. And so one of the things we wanted to throw out is like, here is a low cost, low time intensive way that really any district in the state could, you could do seven pages, one per pathway um, to cultivate potential partnerships. And then one of the things that in talking about this yesterday, we shared back, make sure you're showing there, posting the cool things that you are doing as, as, social media has become less centered in a single place versus maybe where it was three or four or five years ago. Um, this is a great way to cultivate specific partners with what's happening in those classrooms, courses that will be part of those course sequences as part of the pathways. And you can organize around the seven career pathways. So you do have to develop partnerships to be able to do the the internships, the 60 hour supervised career development experiences themselves. And so we wanted to give a call out to that as an idea to do that. Heather, if you wanna jump in on any of this, um, please feel free. Um, these are kind of the key elements that define the internship, um, that these have to occur under authentic working conditions, ideally in a workplace setting if they're remote, it's gotta be because that is authentic in that, in that uh, work environment. Heather? Yes, um, I think that, uh, yeah, this is a nice overview, and I'm really excited when we have our speakers in, in a few minutes to talk about this because they're going to give you specific examples of what this could look like. So I get a, quite a bit of questions on this, and I, I completely understand why when we did the survey, we got this as uh, one of those topics that we really needed to explore. Um, I think that there's another slide that's coming up that kind of highlights some of those frequently asked questions. Yep. Um, and so, but yes, yeah, just what's on this page is really what we're looking for um, when you do your submission. Uh, and and I don't need, I know that sometimes they'll send in, well, I need to link which skills um, it relates to it. That's not what we're looking for that. It's, it's more that conversation that's happening between the school district and that employee or em employer basically for them. Um, and, and what that's going to look like for the students to get that skill assessment. Yeah, so, uh, and and the third bullet there, just to call out in terms of the requirements, students do have to either earn credit and or be paid. 
Um, obviously, where the money comes from to pay the students can be a challenge. Um, in a perfect world, they would get both. And so you'll see that come up in the questions that Heather was Heather was just referencing. Um, so this is the skills assessment and then the 60 hours and how those can be divided out. Heather, comments on this? Yeah, so um, the, the rules state now that it is a minimum of those 60 hours um, and it can be two different or distinct experiences um, that, that can be combined. We're also looking for a minimum of 20. So you can have a 40-20 split or a 30-30 split or all 60 hours or more. Uh, so I have, I have some that have reached out and said, well, it's really more than 60. Can I put more than 60 in my description? Absolutely, you can put more than 60. We're just uh, looking for that minimum of 60. And again, that minimum is legislative, uh, just so yeah. everybody's clear on that. Yeah. Um, so. so here are the common questions. Heather just answered the first one. Heather, you want to jump in on highlighting yeah. some of these other ones? Yep. So, and, and we talked a little bit, does it have to be paid? No. And as Jason mentioned, ideally, we'd, we'd love to see both, both for that, that student, that they're getting credit and they're having the opportunity to be paid. Um, and, and as it states, they're paying the students can address those concerns about equity. Uh, and then does it have to be credit bearing? And again, technically, no, because it's and or for, for that component. Um, but I really advocate for it to be credit bearing for it for that student, uh, if possible. Yeah, and, and Bill and I and other members of our current, of both of our current and former team, one of the questions we've said, and, and certainly I don't, I don't want to have this debate right now, um, but if there is a debate around this, that would be one that uh, we could take offline and then come back to at some point. Um, is you know what what are the reasons to not have students earn credit for it? We we're not seeing a good reason to do that, and so um, great question from Terry. There's questions from Cassie and Terry there uh, in the yeah, chat. Cassie, Heather, I don't know if you want to address those. Sure. Yep, Cassie. Um, yep. I, I just emailed this morning trying to find out when those rules were going to be posted, but they will be released for public comment as soon as I have that information. I'll make sure to get it out to the group. Um, but they are not passed and they're not final. So the board has approved them. Um, but then that the next step then is that they're out for public comment. Um, and to be counted as work-based learning on our Perkins data, it has to be credit bearing. Um, yes, you would have to code it that way if you're gonna go through the Perkins data, yes. And and that- Or embedded, we do have, I'm sorry, Jason, I didn't mean to Please, interrupt no, you. Go ahead. We do have some classes um, that it's embedded into, and we've identified those. So if you look at the data metrics for the Perkins for that particular indicator, you can see the courses. We've actually identified those courses that have the hours embedded, and then that would count for that. Um, and the CNA is one example of that, that course. Um, however, that is, even though it's embedded, it's not for this, it's not pertaining to this in the sense that it's not necessarily the 60 hours. So you have to be careful with, with that. So we're recognizing that within the Perkins um, in, a, in a course that's not coded for a group five. And and I, I wanna mention one other thing here and I don't wanna confuse the issue, but I really appreciate Terry bringing up the Perkins work-based learning overlap here um, because while most of the, maybe all of the internship work that's been done up until this point has been certainly based in CTE, if not meeting the Perkins qualifications, um, also, it doesn't have to for the for the career pathway endorsement right. requirements. So, for example, we we I there is a world in which at some point in the future you could have a biology teacher who's also earned the work based learning designation and is supporting a group of a handful of students who are out in a a really a biology-based work-based learning experience. And so I just want people to remember that there's uh, quite a bit of flexibility and that ultimately the Post-Secondary and Workforce Readiness Act is meant to be a broad curricular uh, legislative initiative and not just a CTE initiative. Now, it moves CTE to the middle of, of more kids, all kids schooling experiences, so. Nope, the hours can count, Angie, uh, for, uh, but they they need to 
uh, for the CNA, they'll they'll need to get the full 60 hours to also earn the endorsement, whereas the CNA requirement is lower than that. We've actually got that coming up in a slide. Hopefully I'm answering that correctly. I'm going to pop on here. Um, I, I think we've got a couple more questions at the end to summarize, but we do have three presentations and we're right on track with time, which is kind of amazing to me. So um, I'll be uh, very excited about that. We've got three different school districts that we're going to have um, presenting here this morning. Um, and cool, I see all three of them now. So first, uh, we're going to go out west to uh, to our, our friends in the Quad Cities here. And Kristen, we know, has already tested and is working. Kristen, if you want to hop on and jump right in and just tell me when you want me to advance the slides, we're really excited to hear this because we're going to go all the way to the right side of the work-based learning continuum here. Sure. Good morning, everybody. Thank you, Jason. Um, again, my name is Kristen Allen. Um, over here in Rock Island, Illinois, just a short drive across the Mississippi River into the state of Iowa. Um, and my role here is secondary teaching and learning coordinator. And so the, the work that we're talking about today is a part of what I do, um, but there's many, many other things I do. And, and my role primarily is support. Uh, we have two junior highs and a large comprehensive high school here in our district. And I support um, really anything and everything that falls under the umbrella of teaching and learning. Um, so, so today um, I am here to talk about um, the reality of how challenging it is to design these 60 hour experiences. And I would be in the 26.5% of you that said, how do we do this? Because I will tell you um, that we still haven't really fully figured that out. And that's okay in this work. Um, I'm jealous when I see a lot of your titles spilling into the chat because I will let you know that we do not have any specific staff in our entire district earmarked for college and career preparation. Um, it's me, some principals and assistant principals, maybe some counseling staff and teachers. We do not have any specialty staff, which can create a challenge um, in some of this work. So we do not have the 60 hours figured out. We are right there with you trying to continue brainstorming and considering possibilities. Um, but what we what we have done, and I guess my message to everyone today is it's okay to start small and it's okay to really look at and capitalize on things that you might already have in place or that might be leading you in the direction of this because our journey um, is almost backwards in a lot of ways. Um, so to give you a little perspective on, on um, what we do and where we are with this, I have to take you back about 12 years ago when I was in a much different role working at Rock Island High School. We had a welding program that was in place. It was um, not as productive as it could have been. We live in an area where there is strong manufacturing. John Deere is in our backyard. And so we began to breathe new life, first and foremost, into our welding program. There was a need for it. We developed a partnership with our local community college. We began to infuse the dual credit opportunities. So that was really the first layer of this many, many years ago before things like CCPE and these endorsed pathways even existed. And we began to build a really good welding program. Um, you probably have areas inside of your schools that you are proud of that are thriving, where there's a need, um, an urgency to develop. That's a great place to start. And that's exactly uh, what we did. Um, about four or five years ago, and I was not directly involved with this, John Deere came knocking on the doors of our high school and some other local high schools and said, hey, you have welding programs, and guess what? We need welders. How could we come together and really make this prosperous for students in the community? And that led to a lengthy and involved process of developing a true welding apprenticeship, which does exist. We have a Department of Labor approved apprenticeship um, that really was initiated by John Deere 
Again, I was not involved in that process, but it is, it is a, um, there's a lot of components that go into the process of developing an apprenticeship. Um, you're following Department of Labor guidelines. Of course, you're designing and developing the skills and competencies, all of which fall inside of the manufacturing skills and competencies um, in the endorsed pathways. You're building a sequence of courses and experiences. Um, they were building a, um, a pay scale, um, et cetera, and there's an application process. Students actually begin an apprenticeship at the, the summer following their junior year. So they, they've completed some welding coursework uh, prior to that. They work a full-time job in the summer for pay. Um, that leads into the following school year as a senior where they work hours throughout the week. Um, they do receive both high school credit and pay. Um, they continue to work throughout their senior year and even beyond the senior year. And honestly, every single student who is in this lands a job um, either at John Deere or another large uh, local manufacturer, McLaughlin Motors. Um, so this, this existed before CCPE. So last year, um, we capitalized on what we already had in place. Welding is going strong. It's thriving. There's a need for it in our community. And we had the makings of a pathway, um, and we embarked on that journey. We were approved late spring, and we had, I believe, seven students, somewhere around seven students earned um, the CCP endorsement because of their involvement in the apprenticeship. Uh, we do not currently have a true 60 hour experience. We have an apprenticeship. We have about 30 to 35 students who enter the welding pathway. There are typically about five to seven who engage in and complete the apprenticeship. That's fantastic. These kids are exiting. In fact, the welding teacher told me he has a student who's been out, I believe, two years now, making close to $80,000 a year. He's had extensive training with John Deere and he's traveling the world. It's, it's just it's, it's phenomenal. Um, but we know this isn't enough because there's another 20, 25 kids who necessarily um, don't want to go this route. Right. They, they, they it's a it's a significant commitment. Um, so we are still trying to consider how do we build other experiences? Um, you know, in a field like manufacturing and welding, you have students age is a concern there to Anthony. Yes. In the apprenticeship um, under the Department of Labor, there are some different guidelines. And that, again, I was not part of that process, but that was worked out with John Deere following Department of Labor guidelines. Um, and most of those students begin when they're around 17. Um, so age is a factor. Um, industry can get saturated because companies can only take on so many kids. Um, time and manpower. You know, I, I described in our district, we don't have a, a crew of people out you know, helping to develop these things. Um, the teacher, the administrator uh, can be saturated with just not enough time or manpower to do this. This program honestly serves a fairly small number of kids. So sometimes there's thousands of those of you who work you know, in high schools directly, you know, there's thousands of priorities on any given day in a high school setting. And oftentimes other things are getting attention. So we are currently beginning to look at how can we build internal? How can we build internal? And thank you, Terry. Terry is saying approved apprenticeship does lower the age to 16. That is correct. But in this particular 60 hours, it is challenging to put a 16-year-old um, a student in a setting where they would truly get welding workplace experience. So we're starting to look internally. We're not there yet. Our first idea um, was to capitalize on some work that students in the class have done in the past, which was um, designing and building things like fire pit rings and lawn and garden ornaments, which all involve welding. And the instructor and I discussed that and it just felt too big to take on right now. So now we're looking at um, potential of um, a repair shop 
We're looking at, you know, um, this, our, our instructor, our main instructor happens to own a, own a lawn care business on the side. So he's been actually having the kids um, learn how to do some repairs on his own trailers and things like that. Just feeling this out to, to consider, could we build an internal repair shop that might allow us to develop a different kind of experience where we can serve more kids. So, you know, my message today is say, we certainly don't have it figured out. We took some things that were going pretty well in our district. We have found some ways to capitalize on them. It's given us lots of ideas. There are still many challenges. Um, and again, I'm going to say I'm super jealous of, uh, of all these CTE coordinators and and uh, career pathway staff that some of you have in your districts, because um, the time, the planning, the conversations, the reaching out, it, it's significant. Um, so we're on a journey. We are proud that we have the endorsement. Uh, we want to do more with it, but just know that starting small and taking, taking steps do matter. And eventually, you know, I hope that like all of you, we will land on a number of different options for our students at Rock Island. Kristen, that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks to everybody for the comments and questions in the chat too. That was really enriching. And I know I have more questions at the moment, but I'm gonna hold those right now so we can go on to the other groups. And I'm gonna encourage you, uh, feel free to keep adding comments and questions to the chat. I do want to get through all three groups. And then, of course, if we've got time, we'll absolutely take questions today. Otherwise, we can take those questions out of the chat and um, and get answers, seek out answers to those and come back to them. So um, thank you again, Kristen. Really, really cool to hear. And um, yeah, what an amazing opportunity for these kids. I'd like to be 20, 20 years old and making $80,000 a year and traveling the world too. That sounds like a, a cool life existence. So with this, we're gonna go over to Elmwood Park uh, High School and Elmwood Park uh, Unit uh, School District 401. We've got Amanda here, who's the principal. Um, Amanda, if you can pop on and unmute yourself and then uh, from there, we're going to go over to uh, Leiden. So Amanda, just let us know when you want me to flip slides as we go here. Awesome. I am not going to take as long because this is very brand new to me. So just a little introduction. I am in my first year as a principal at Elmwood Park High School. We are what I consider a small high school of only just over a thousand outside of O'Hare Airport. Um, so kind of to what Kristen was saying as well, we do not have a person here who is specifically dedicated to college and career pathway, and thus it becomes me. The three years prior to this, I was at Lake Park High School in Roselle, Illinois, where I had an assistant principal, and this was her focus. She's actually on here, and I want to give a shout out to her. That's Kate Foster. She was amazing at this work, and I really relied upon her to kind of educate me on all of this, but I was very far removed. So this is the first year that I'm really kind of diving in head first with this work. Um, so... I'm very much learning as I go along. Uh, so I will kind of give you the rundown as to what I've learned about what we're doing here. So if you could uh, flip to the next slide, that would be great. All right, so we do have one college and career pathway here and that is in our business area. So the way it essentially functions is our students have to take two full years of um, business courses. So usually what that looks like is Typically within their freshman and sophomore year, they're gonna take two semester courses and the offerings that the, they're gonna select from are either business principles, specifically information processing two or business law. So they'll take two of those. And then from there, their second year is going to be where they get this workplace experience learning. And that is a year long course called Virtual Enterprises International, which is a nationwide course. So kids are taking this course across the US. Um, so our teachers essentially provided a curriculum that they use for this course. Any of you who have incubator at your school, which we had at Lake Park last year, it essentially functions the same way. So what is happening is the students are coming into this class. 
they're coming up with a product and then each of the kids are taking on a different role. Maybe they're going to be working on the marketing portion of it. Maybe they're working on the accounting portion of it. And so what's really cool in that respect is a student can actually take Virtual Enterprises International multiple times. They could take it two years in a row because the one year they may be focusing on the marketing portion of it. And then the next year they're going to be in it and they're going to be doing the accounting portion of it. So that's what also makes it kind of unique, but that's where they're going to get those 60 hours. Also for this particular program, we um, partner with a community college that is literally right around the corner from us, which is wonderful. Um, and that's Triton College. So our teacher here at Elmwood Park who teaches this course is dual credit certified to teach the course. So our kids will walk away also getting a college transcript with the grade. Um, and then as far as the mentorship portion goes with the VEI curriculum, they will actually take trips to compete um, at our Wednesday board meeting this week. Actually, our teacher, Mr. El Defonso, went in front of the board to get it approved that our students be able to take um, a trip to New York City to be able to do their competition. And that's where the mentorship really happens. Um, the students will get feedback on their product and kind of how they're doing it. Um, and that's where the mentorship occurs. So that's kind of what it looks like here at Elmwood Park for our workplace learning portion. So Amanda, we did have a couple quick questions. I wanna take a couple of these real quickly. Sure. Uh, and I will maybe do I'm my regretting it now. Them. Maybe I'm regretting it now as the questions keep coming in, which is awesome. Um, but do you know, do you know costs, first of all? I don't. Uh, I mean, okay. as far as I know, um, there may be a cost of fixed because, well, no, I, I don't think there is. The only thing that there's going to be a cost for is for their travel, I believe. But I will get a certain answer on that. But they do fundraising for that. So, so no out-of-pocket, really. And then the next question is, um, do you know what the dual credit courses are on the Triton side that students are actually yes. earning dual credit for? Just had this conversation about an hour ago. It, it's going to be called entrepreneurship at the community college. So, and again, this is a great lead in. It's a great preview to the February meeting. Uh, because we we might have had, I mentioned that Rodrigo and I yesterday just had a conversation about this. It, it might have been with business teachers at a, a neighboring high school to Elmwood Park, actually, that is also a Triton Center District School. Yep. And so there's a lot to consider. And obviously, there's a lot to consider in terms of who our teachers are and what they can be credentialed to teach. Like, there's so many factors that we need to be thinking of when making these choices. So that's great. And then um, I might go with one more of these can i oh, just from, add something to yeah please what you just go said? ahead so yes. on the note of that we were kind of in a hiring bind this summer because we had this position vacant and it took us quite a few rounds of interviews to specifically find because this is a class we want to maintain um given what it is it's our only pathway so as we were hiring this summer we had to look for somebody who is specifically qualified to do this course and we got real lucky but it was literally down to the wire of us hiring because we needed this specific course. <laughs> so that's a really important point because we heard Amanda say that, you know, she considers Elmwood Park to be a small school of about a thousand students. We know there's there's hundreds yes. and hundreds of high schools around the state that would go, whoa, that's a really big school. <laughs> um, certainly in suburban Chicago, that is a relatively small high school, um, but across the state, that's a very medium large high school. And so um, so that we know, we know what an issue that is. Uh, and when you have someone who leaves who was teaching the dual credit class in a smaller school, it's an even more significant issue. It's one of the reasons that uh, through the work that we've done on the Peachway Network side through the dual credit think tank, we've talked a lot about how school size is actually one of the factors that oftentimes is a hidden factor that matters in what, what can realistically be offered. Um, it's not a not a legal factor or a financial factor necessarily, but practically. Um, so, all right. Well, thank you. Heather's looking up stuff, I think, from the application itself. And um, there are more questions here, but I'm going to leave those now. And I apologize to those of you who've asked them. We'll see if we can come back to those. If not, thank you for putting them in the chat so we can pull them from this portion and uh, go back to Amanda and the team at Elmwood Park and see if we can get answers to those. And then we'll be Definitely. able to share those out via email. So Amanda, 
thank you so much. Um, it's awesome and uh, it's great. And with that, we're gonna go again, kind of around the corner um, to Leiden High School. Um, we've got Frank and Tony sitting together, uh, which is cool, that's fun. And so uh, we're gonna turn it over to you guys. When you want me to move the slides, just let me know. Thank you so much, Jason. Hi everyone, um, I'm Frank Holthaus. I'm Tony Pagucci. Uh, we're, we're coming live from our TSI room um, here at Leiden, and we are just around the corner from Elmwood. So uh, great to see so many awesome partners on the call. Um, yeah, so uh, Leiden High Schools, if you're not familiar, is a two school high school district. Uh, we serve approximately 3,600 students over two campuses. Uh, we are a comprehensive high school. We support all pathways to success. And a big part of that success is our TSI program, which we'll be talking about now. If you go to the next slide, please. You want to take this yeah, one? Yeah, sure. So uh, just to give you a breakdown of our technical support internship, this program was brought on when we brought our Chromebooks into the school. We have 1,800 Chromebooks or I guess 1,600 Chromebooks at either school that fluctuates from year to year. Uh, but our technical support internship is a capstone course. So basically, our students take that kind of the end of our tech pathway. Um, they can take it as a sophomore. They can take it as a junior. They can take it again as a senior for credit. Um, and a lot of our students do that. Uh, what's cool about the program, we are the first point of contact on all technical issues at our school. So even if it's an administrator, a teacher, um, anyone in the school has a technical problem, they have to go through TSI first. Uh, TSI uh, then answers the phone or takes all incoming traffic and then determines how we support that issue. Um, obviously, our priority one is to support the student Chromebooks. We have to make sure that there's a Chromebook in the student's hand every part of the day. So we're always making sure that we're supporting those via fixing them or making sure that um, students who have uncharged or forgot Chromebooks have one. Uh, we also support faculty and staff technology. So any classroom issues that come along with the smart boards, the projectors, audio, any classroom technology, TSI students are dispersed out to the classroom and they are basically working on those issues. And then our third one, which we'll talk a little bit further, is they select and work on a pathway of learning. So they, they have an opportunity to kind of pursue uh, what they want to pursue when they're not working um, on some of the other things that we have. Yeah, so just to touch on that, we were one of the first school districts to go 101 with a Google Chromebook um, and trying to problem solve that. Do we hire more faculty and staff to support those? Uh, are there more creative solutions? And so we had just, again, a really innovative and creative team that came up with this TSI idea. And, um, you know, uh, we can't really control when these tickets and issues come. Uh, they kind of come in waves, right? So a Monday after a long weekend, we know we're going to get a lot of tickets and we'll mainly be focusing on priorities one and two. And then it's like a Wednesday and things are humming along and we're not getting a lot of tickets. So we got to keep those students busy. And that's where that pathway of learning comes in, which we'll talk about next. So. Yeah. Next slide, if you will. So uh, we offer certifications in TSI. We're actually a certified uh, CompTIA testing center here. We're a private testing center, which basically means that our students can take certification tests in our building. Um, that wasn't always the case. We used to have to take students off of campus to various testing centers to get tested. Uh, but through a lot of work, we were able to partner with CompTIA and Pearson to actually have a testing center in our school. Um, our, our main priority or our main certification is the CompTIA A+. If you're not familiar with that, that's kind of like a globally recognized IT certification for entry-level IT people. Um, so we kind of call it the silver bullet, um, for our certification at our school, because what it does is it provides immediate employment opportunities for students. Um, we've seen that through the years of the program. Many, many, many students have gotten jobs right out of high school uh, by completing the A+. Plus. Um, up to date, we have 188 Leiden students that are certified through A+, plus, so we're, we're pretty proud of that number, and we've seen a lot of success through that. And just to touch on that a second, I, you know, this, this credential is backed up by our advisory council. We just had a meeting last week. Today, our advisory council is mainly made up of alumni that are working in the field, so we could see that this process has worked, right? They are now out in the field doing the things and being practitioners, um, and then also backed up by our tech department. So, we're level one tech support here in TSI, but we also have level two and level three and a whole tech director, and they meet with our TSI program to make sure that there's some authenticity behind the work that we do. Yep. Next slide, please. I'm going to interject right there, though, real quickly. Um, and and we also see the question popped up in the chat, too. And you may come back to this with the slide where you talk about some of your superstars, and that's fine. We can hold off on it. But if you can work in kind of what some of the paths some of these students are have gone through post high school and who some of the companies are that they work for and 
because um, I know that there's a variety of different paths that have resulted for these students, which I think is is one of the very cool things. So I will click the slides and you guys keep on going there. Right. So uh, just to capitalize on that a little bit, we do have the various employment opportunities. And what, what we have done now is we have a direct link to various recruiters in the Chicago area uh, that are basically networking with students once their certification is obtained. Uh, so getting an A-plus certification, if you put that on LinkedIn, Monster, Indeed, um, you're getting calls the next day. <laughs> so people are calling you and asking you, um, you know, can you work? Uh, really, the A-plus is globally recognized. So showing that you've completed that certification says a lot about you. Uh, and you know your stuff if you've completed that certification. So our students do get immediate opportunities out of the A-plus. Um, and we're really happy about that because then they have the choice to, to kind of go to work or they could go to entry level uh, positions uh, or they could go to, uh, you know, junior college or even a four year college as well. So. Next slide, please. Uh, just to kind of further the certifications, we offer Office Microsoft Office that's also offered on campus. So Microsoft Word, Excel, PowerPoint access. Um, students have completed almost 1,250 certifications since we've done this. Um, what we found out of all of these is that Excel provides the best marketable, marketable skill for students. The other certifications are important. It's important to know PowerPoint and Word and Access. Uh, but because so many small companies in our community still use Excel as a part of the way to run their businesses, uh, what we found is Excel is really marketable when we're trying to get students jobs. So there's a lot of small business opportunities within our community uh, because they're always looking for people who can do Excel, uh, graphing, pivot tables, things that are important, um, you know, in that regard. Next. Uh, we just offered Google IT. Google IT is actually free. So uh, any uh, student can actually get Google IT certified. Uh, it's new to Leiden as of fall 2021. There are five modules that are involved. Um, Google will claim that this is pretty equivalent to the A plus that we had just talked about. Uh, we would kind of agree with that with the exception of there's no final test for the certification. So students can actually go through all the modules, complete all the quizzes and, and tests that go along with it. And then they become Google IT certified. So we've had 40 uh, TSI students that have completed this cert certification so far. Uh, we still believe the A plus is more a powerful certification in terms of employment, but um, this is a nice one to have on your resume, especially with the Google name attached. I think we have one last one. Okay. Yep. Yeah, and this is our last one. These are just examples of students who have gotten uh, jobs out of TSI. Like I said, we have had many students get jobs out of TSI, but um, the reason I like this slide is uh, you have one student who went immediate into the workplace. You have one student that's at Michigan State University, and you have one student that's at junior college, right? So they've all taken kind of different routes. Um, all of them have multiple certifications, A+. Plus. Um, if you finish A+, plus here, you could do Net+, plus, Security+, plus, Cloud+. Plus. The guy on the left completed maybe like three or four of those, uh, which is great because he gets out with all of that under his resume and in his belt. Um, he has some work experience with a local uh, PC shop right now. He's been working there for about a year. Um, and then they're also college and career ready as well in terms of getting these certifications. So it's a, it's a good way to show that no matter where you are on your path, um, these certifications do help you out. I'm going to jump in and wrap up a couple things here real quickly. Heather, please jump in if you'd like to. Again, there's more questions in the chat for our friends from Leiden. Um, again, it's amazing stuff. I've got even more questions and I knew what was being presented. And so I'm sure there's additional questions out there. So please don't be shy about over these next couple moments, dropping those in. Um, so that, you know, one of the things we do want to think about is that these opportunities are leadership opportunities uh, for themselves and with their peers. I mean, until we've, we've completely restructured school where all kids are getting these. And I think that's an important point to consider in thinking about how you're preparing for this. And then the other thing is one of the things we talk about with our uh, forming uh, community and business partnerships workshop is we want to put ourselves in the shoes of our partners. We really want to think about uh, be empathetic from like a design perspective for where our partners are at. And so that's something we'd encourage all of you to do. And, and then um, different partners will have different abilities to offer different things. And frankly, some may start real small and grow into long-term, very large partners. Others may start big and it may be a great experience, but there may be other reasons that they need to step back from that 
without it having been something negative that caused that. And so partnerships will change and evolve over time too. And all of these are areas where you can continue thinking about where the partner can, can exist. So one of the common questions that came up earlier today, it always comes up, Heather referred to this also, um, is the CNA. Um, it, where where do the extra times come from? And we're not suggesting that these are solutions. We are saying that these are solutions that districts have solved, used to solve this, even uh, particularly in a first year. What, what we've also found is a first year where the first year we're doing the endorsements, we put in some solutions in place that we don't use in the second or third year anymore because we're able to fill out that 60 hour experience in much the same way we're filling out the shorter CNA experience. But that first year it might be, hey, let's add some weekend time. Let's add some spring break or winter time. And frankly, depending on where your partner is, um, they may love that. Like weekends are times that, for example, senior living uh, centers are are less well staffed on weekends, but the needs of residents don't change uh, on a Saturday versus a Friday. And so, um, and of course, for some of our students, weekends might actually be a better time for them to complete those extra hours. Uh, and then for other students, weekends are worse time, right? So um, just it, having having kind of that range of of options there. Heather, anything to add here? No, I think you uh, summarized that quite nicely. <laughs> so if there's any, I, I see the messages keep coming in. Um, and so what we'll do is I, I don't want to keep our our uh, featured guests today any longer uh, because I'm sure they have other things to do. But certainly, as usual, we will stay on. And if any of them can stay on, um, I know Amanda went through and tried to reply to some things in the chat. We will also obviously export this chat. And one of the things that um, we'll do is go through that. Uh, probably we'll probably get the video up on YouTube first and then separately go through the chat and try and call out answers and use the, use the Google group to get those out to everybody. Um, but we're happy to stay on. I do wanna thank all the districts that, uh, that participated. I wanna remind everybody that we know many, many people could have participated. A couple other really important reminders. And Rodrigo, if you want to drop the link in the chat for the evaluation, uh, we know we've lost a few people here as we're wrapping up. Having these evaluations is really important to us. We look at these from every event we do and are constantly making adjustments to uh, not only how we're delivering uh, workshops and other learning opportunities, but what we're delivering. Um, in addition to that, though, the December 15th meeting, that is the day our applications are due for the 23-24 endorsements. So we said it does not make sense to have a different meeting that day. We're gonna add an extended office hours uh, in addition to Heather, not that you want this, but Bill and I will also be there and can help. And um, and so, and there will be a time where people can help together. We can shift into breakout rooms if there's certain needs. You don't have to, you don't have to come at all. You can drop in for as long as short as you want, just like the regular office hours that Heather is doing every week. Heather, any comment about that? Nope. We just decided that that would be the best use of time for that. So um, I will have office hours. I haven't set my December date yet, but I will have office hours earlier in the week. And then in addition to um, this one on, on that Friday. Um, and then again, we've got these additional resources linked in the link to the evaluation. And again, if you could please, please, please uh, complete the evaluation for us, that would be great. Um, and then um, remember, here is the email address that you would send to uh, send an email to the Google group. It's as simple as copying that and pasting it into your email and sharing something cool you've done, asking a question, uh, highlighting a newspaper article about another school in your area that you saw. And so um, thanks again to our presenters today and to all of you for all the work you're doing with kids and teachers every day and um, for helping one another out as we go.